welcome to today's Sabbath service. And today uh, we're going to be going through uh, a powerful message that God put on my heart today uh, about uh, the Bible, of course, and about uh, who are the bride of Christ. Um, God put that on my heart last night, so I'm going to pass this out. Uh, all of you have the scriptures in your email, uh, but um, we're going to be going through the scriptures. It looks like there may be a lot of scriptures, but God is uh, very efficient in how he um, likes to display this message. And so this was something God put on my heart today to, to share with you, and I'm really um, excited to do this because um, God wants you to know who the bride of Christ are. And so we're going to be going through a lot of scripture, um, and, but, and we're also going to show you some things that God has been doing around, his wor around the world. So I'm going to show you a few things here. Let me show you this real quick. Okay. First thing I want you to know is that Jesus is finding his bride. Um, he's finding his bride with or without us. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. He's calling his bride um, back into covenant around the world. So I want to show you this is um, uh, Praveen Paul from India. Uh, Praveen Paul was one of the gentlemen that we did the message with the other day. And this is, uh, just so you can get a little feel for it, this was the projecting screen that they were testing as they were getting all the rooms set up. So they were, those were all the chairs and everything they were getting set up and they were setting up the computer and their sound system. And I was talking to them as they were doing this. So it was kind of cool watching them put it all together. And then this is at the beginning of the message when uh, I think this is his father and his father was gonna um, introduce me. Um, because I was, you know, of course online, but he was gonna introduce and he was starting to welcome people in and they were playing music. And these guys on the right there, they were out in the back because um, they were cooking, because we fed them as well. Not only did we teach them the Word of God um, and feed them the Word of God, we fed them food as well. And so they were back there in the back preparing, um, along with some of the other ladies, um, they were preparing the food. And then, you know, they started to trickle in. And they had a big room, a big space available, and uh, this is their room, and, you know, a couple of the pastors. Now, by the way, these are all pastors. Each one of these pastors has a congregation of anywhere from five people, because some of them have a hundred people. So they're all different pastors from the area. And these men went around and told them about this event and invited them to it. And then they came on their own. They came down to this event. So they started to trickle in. And as they started to trickle in, they started singing. And they were praising God and standing up and worshiping God as, you know, the seats are still not all filled, but they were coming in. And as they were coming in, you know, it just started to feel, um, get a little bit um, feel, filled even more. And there's the ladies over there on the side. And it was pretty awesome because the men were up here worshiping, the women were serving them. And, and it was really awesome, an awesome scene to, to see. But these were all pastors and the wives and some of the ladies there and the orphans. Because some of the orphans were there too, the children. But this message was for the pastors. And so all the pastors were there honoring God and worshiping as we um, started to kick it off. And so I just wanted to see just a little bit about what was going on. And this room ended up filling up to about 150 people. Actually, about 115 people. Uh, that's what he said they had by the time it was done. 115 people were there, pastors, that got the message and went out, took it, and were fired up after they were done. So uh, I just wanted to just get you a little insight. And then uh, there was another gentleman, uh, Kumar. And Kumar is in another part of India, and this was about 100 miles or more away from where the first one was. So what we did is we combined the two. And because of Zoom, you know, like all of you are in different parts of the world, all of them were in different parts of the world. So they had a different group in a different part of the world. And so what he did was the same thing. He actually created a space as well, and he started inviting pastors. So he started inviting pastors, and these were the guys as they were starting to line up. Uh, and then they came in. And and again, that's a different room. On the same day, preaching to all these pastors. And they're all worshiping God. Now remember, none of them have ever heard from me before. None of them knew me from Adam. But they were all worshiping God and honoring, you know, the, the God the Father and Jesus. And, and it was amazing because they sat down and then um, they started praying. And, and then we started teaching the message. And you can see back there in the back is the screen. Um, that's, the, that's where my projector was. So... I was actually teaching and they're watching the screen there as we're going through it. They were singing songs at this particular moment. Then after it was all said and done, then again we fed that group too. 
So remember when I mentioned that God blessed our ministry with a, a motorcycle and we were able to sell it and generate cash and it was, you know, the perfect amount to be able to pull off these events and it was amazing because it happened so fast, but because of that, we were able to feed them as well. So hundreds of men and women and children ate that day because we were able to feed them. Um, and then another thing that's going to happen now on the 9th of this month, there's another gentleman, um, his name is uh, Robert. Robert is actually going to be doing another message similar in um, Kenya. And this is his flyer. And we're going to be teaching this there. And, and the same thing, people are going to be logging in from different areas. And this is you know, him and, and the men that he teaches. And he's going to be doing a message similar out in Kenya. Um, and then other brothers that I've been meeting named James and Dennis and, and some of the other people that I've been speak, reaching out to. And now pastors are coming to me left and right from Facebook saying, I, wanna, I want you to do it here. I just had another one last night saying, I would love you to teach in Bangladesh. And I said, do you have a computer and a projector? He said, we have a computer, but we'll get the projector. I said, okay, then we'll make it happen. And God's opening the floodgates to his message. And he's doing it all around the world. Now, right here in the U.S., unfortunately, most don't want to hear the message. You do, but most don't. So God said, okay, I'm going to go elsewhere, and I'm going to go find my bride wherever they are. And this is another gentleman, he's here today, uh, uh, this, yeah, actually, this is Emmanuel, and the one that just prayed for us, he actually is the, doing the same thing, Emmanuel, he actually has um, printed out our PowerPoint, and he made copies, he made over 400 copies, and he's taking this out to pastors, over 100 pastors, and he's getting it out to over 300 people, disciples of Jesus, that want to know the truth, and he's actually going town to town, house to house, meeting the people, and invite them to an event. And he's anticipating having three to 400 people at his event. And his is on August 16th. And that's only happened from this one transaction of this motorcycle sale. God took two fish and, you know, a couple pieces of bread and expanded it big time. Because he found some men that have the heart that want to know the truth and are willing to see it in the scriptures and be obedient to it. And so, I just want you to know about something else that just happened today. This was kind of like a revision of my PowerPoint, that this gentleman, this is uh, James, James uh, just told me that uh, he had a bunch of baptisms about an hour ago, or actually a few hours ago. And this is them. And they're in, in Kenya, in a different part of Kenya. And this is them, today. This is them last night. Because up to this point, they didn't understand baptism for forgiveness of sin. They didn't get it. They didn't know what it meant. They didn't understand how it worked. But when I shared it with them in the scriptures, and they got it, and they understood the Sabbath day, they honored the Sabbath day, and they went, and they started baptizing their people for the forgiveness of their sin. These are your brothers and sisters you guys are looking at right here. These are um, the people in, in the Bible that the Bible says that have been um, strung out there to dry, pretty much. That have been um, kicked away, kicked away in Deuteronomy 28. If you read 20, Deuteronomy 28, verse 15 through 68, you'll see who God's people are, and these are some of them. But now they're getting their sins forgiven. These are some of the people. He went out and he, in a full suit. He didn't change the suit. He just went out there and made it happen. And so these guys out there uh, baptizing these ladies and these men, um, getting them sins, their sins forgiven, and then they. Uh, are eating together, and, and, and these are all the kids and teens, you know, watching. And there was about, uh, I think they said, 8 to 12 baptisms today, uh, which was last night. Uh, that was today, their time, which uh, was, in, you know, last night for them. So I just want you to know, God is using you powerfully in a big way. And this is just the beginning. We have all the way till the Feast of Trumpets. <laughs> if, if God did this much in this short period of time... What's he going to do over the next 30 to 40 days? It's going to be amazing. Because, you know, he built a whole, you know, you know, everything in six days. He created heaven and earth. And, yeah, we know that could be a thousand years. We got that. But what can he do? God could do amazing things, and he's going to. Because the prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. I prayed that I could be on the biggest stage in the world to teach this message. And God has now given me the biggest stage in the world to teach this message, which is Facebook. 
That's the biggest stage in the world. And now he's and Zoom makes the live broadcast and have the ability to teach this message all over the world with no limits. And so that's what God's been doing. And so the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. So I pray that you continue in prayer. And so one of the things we're going to do is we're going to have a month-long prayer chain um, starting soon. Um, and what we want you to pray about is, one, that you're found worthy by the Lord. That's the number one thing we want you to pray about for yourself, is that you are found worthy. Because we don't want to deceive ourselves thinking that we're worthy and we're not. And the scriptures today that we're going to go through, we haven't even started the scriptures yet. The scriptures we're going to go through are going to help us decide if we're worthy, if the Bible is going to show it. Many people um, get saved through, saved by truth, and repent, and are baptized. That's another thing we want you to pray. Um, we want to pray for your friends and family and your loved ones. Pray for them to be open to the message. We want to pray that people begin keeping the commandments of God, the Ten Commandments. We want to pray that um, you can learn it and other people can learn this, how to keep the seventh day holy based on God's calendar. And also learn to keep um, the Lord's appointed feast days, which of course the next one is the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles. And then of course, we want to also want to pray that Jesus comes back on the Feast of Trumpets, September 11th, 2018. Uh, that's the day we believe he's coming based on the scriptures and based on what we're seeing in, in the signs of the times. Um, however, we want you to pray about this. And we want to have a month-long prayer time. So I've created a flyer um, for the Feast of Trumpets. And I'll send this out to you guys. And it says, join us in a worldwide prayer chain every day. From the first day of the sixth month to the Feast of Trumpets, the first day of the seventh month. Which that's going to be coming up in about, two, in about another week and a half. So we're going to be praying that the Lord will come to get his bride on that great day of the Lord. So that's what I want to pray for you, that you'll do, that you'll put this in your heart, that you'll pray every day. That you'll make it a habit every day to pray this prayer. So who are the Bride of Christ? That's the title of this message. Who are the Bride of Christ? So we're going to look at a bunch of scriptures here. Let's go to the Bible now. We're going to look at a bunch of scripture. And I'm going to do my best to go through it as, as swift as possible. But we're looking at James 5. James 5. We're going to start in verse 1. It says... Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached their ears of the Lord Almighty. You who live on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence, you have fattened yourself in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Be patient then, brothers and sisters. So now he's talking to you. Until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop patiently, waiting for the autumn and spring rains? You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we counted as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. See, Job went through trouble. He went through a lot of challenges. But God blessed him with you know, a bigger family and more kids and more crops and everything else. And that's going to happen for us, all that we've struggled and labored for the Lord. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear by heaven or by earth or by anything else. 
All you need to say is simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. The prayer of faith. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? Let them call the elders for a church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make a sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. For the prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly as it would not, that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Wow. Could you imagine praying a prayer that it would not rain? And it didn't rain for three and a half years. Well, I want to pray for you, some of you brothers over in Africa. There's a brother named Chris right now that's struggling over there. He has a bunch of people that want to get baptized. But it's going to take them, it takes close to 100 miles to get to a, a body of water where they can baptize. Because the water in their little area is for the whole town. And there's very little. And they don't have the water to baptize. And I said, bro, pray. Dig a hole. Put some concrete in the hole. And pray for rain. Because if he could pray that there was no rain and didn't rain for three and a half years, we as a body can pray for rain. And God can give them rain so they can be baptized for the forgiveness of their sin. Verse 18, again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, as one of you should wonder from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their ways will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. So this is one of the things that God wanted me to share with you, is that this is his bride right here. These are part of the bride right here of these people uh, that are going through this. So we need to know who these people are. So we're going to look at a bunch of scriptures to see who the bride are. Now some of these we've gone over, so I'm going to go over them really fast because you know them. But I want to put this on record so that the people that are watching this video for the first time, you may not know this. So let's look at a few scriptures about who the bride of Christ is. 1 Thessalonians 4, starting in verse 13. Brothers and sisters... Whenever you see the scriptures that says brothers and sisters, we know he's talking to us. He's talking to the body of Christ. Very important to understand that. So brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. So we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own words, we tell you that we who are still alive and are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. So this is the bride. These are the dead in Christ, and those who are alive when he comes on the Feast of Trumpets. That would be considered the bride. So let's look at a couple other scriptures on that. Because I want you, the Lord really wants you to really get this so there's no misunderstanding who the bride is and who the bride isn't. Let's keep reading. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1. It says, Now, brothers and sisters, about the times and dates, we don't need to write you. Now, why would he say that? Why doesn't he need to read the, tell them the times and dates? See, because they know the appointed times. They've been honoring the feast days. These, these brothers and sisters were honoring the feast days, just as we're honoring the feast days. That's what we don't need to tell you. Look what it says. Now, brothers and sisters, about the times and dates, we don't need to write you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. So the brothers and sisters, they know. The people that um, are saying peace and safety, destruction is going to come on them. That's two different groups of people. Let's keep reading, verse 4. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day will not surprise you like a thief. 
See, it's not going to surprise Lehman like a thief because I honor the Feast of Trumpets every year. I never miss the Feast of Trumpets. I never miss the Sabbath day. I'm not deceived on what day it is. I'm not worried. I don't, put, I don't add the Gregorian calendar into the equation. See, I understand I'm on God's calendar. So I know the days just as all of you do. But if you don't know this, this is something you need to learn. But look what it says, verse 5. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we have belonged to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith as, and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. You should write down that scripture, verse 9. You should circle that. Verse 9. It said, the Lord did not appoint us to suffer wrath. The wrath is called the great tribulation. So whoever this bride is, is not going to suffer wrath. That's what you got to understand. Let's keep reading. Verse 10. He died for us, so whether we're awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just in fact that you are doing. And that's what this message is for. To build you up. To encourage you. That you just need to be ready and be prepared to be the bride of Christ. So let's keep going though. Let's keep going because there's a few more scriptures the Lord wants to show you about who the bride of Christ is. So there's no misunderstanding. I know a lot of these scriptures you've seen because you've been here for a while. But there's many that have just learned this for the first time. Like the brothers in India and in Africa, they've never seen this before. So this is encouraging for them. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 20. It says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of dead also comes through a man. For in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But, for, but each in turn. So this is important to understand. This is the term. Each in turn. It says Christ, the first fruit. So Christ is already risen from the dead. So he was the first fruit. Then it says, then when he comes, those who belong to him. That's the bride. The bride of Christ are those who, when he comes to get us on the cloud, those that belong to him are going to go up to meet him. That's that group. The fourth one is 24. It says, Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to the God of the Father and has destroyed all dominion and power and authority and power. You see, so you've got to understand who the bride is. It's this group. Okay? So it's Christ and then the first fruits, which are us. And then when he comes, those who belong to him. That's, one, that's two different groups. That's the bride and it's also the wedding party. We went through that message last week on the scriptures. So it's very important to understand how that works. Let's keep reading. Let's go down to verse 50. It says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. In a flash, at the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. So that's the trumpet. If you notice, all these things have a trumpet. So at the last trumpet will sound, and we will be changed. So this is very important to understand. This is who the bride of Christ is. Let's look at a couple of scriptures in uh, Matthew, Matthew 25. The Lord wants you to be confident in who the bride is so you know exactly who it is. This is the parable of the ten virgins. The parable of the ten virgins. It says, verse 25, verse 1, At that time the kingdom of heaven was like ten virgins who took their lamps 
and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish one took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took their oil in jars, along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for you, uh, us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. But while they were on the way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day of the hour. So this is a very important scripture, because this is one of the first scriptures that put, God put on my wife's heart, to understand that, you know, there's five virgins, five were wise and five were unwise. And when I looked at the scripture years ago, I said, well, what made those unwise unwise? And that's what I needed to understand. And so I did a whole study on it. And come to find out, they didn't have enough oil for their lamps. And after I studied out what the oil for the lamp was, I realized that the oil for the lamp, based on the scriptures, is that they weren't honoring the Sabbath day. They weren't honoring the Ten Commandments. They didn't have the Holy Spirit because maybe they weren't baptized for the forgiveness of their sin. Actually, that's not true. The, Holy, the oil is actually only the obedience to the commandments and honoring the Sabbath day and the holy days. It's not baptism. Because they wouldn't even be considered brides if they hadn't been baptized. So these brides were all baptized disciples. They were all waiting for Jesus. They were all calling on him. They were all there dressed in white. They had already purified themselves in a lot of ways. But they weren't honoring the commandments and honoring the Sabbath day and his holy days. They weren't ready. You know, one of the things they probably said, ah, no man knows the day of the hour. You see how people always say that? It's no man knows the day of the hour. See, but we just revealed, because God revealed it last week or two weeks ago, the day that no man knows is the new moon celebration. And the Feast of Trumpets is the only feast day that lands on the new moon celebration. And that is the day that's called the day that no man knows, because it could be one of two days. You can watch the video on our, on our YouTube channel about the day that no man knows, and you can learn all about that. But it's very important to understand that these bride members, five were foolish, five were wise. And only the wise went in as the bride. The other ones still got to watch because they don't know the day of the hour he's coming back to get the wedding party. That's a different feast. That's called the Day of Atonement. You understand? So you want to be the bride because the bride is the one that does not go through God's wrath in the great tribulation. So let's keep going though. Let's look at a few more scriptures so you can know clearly who this is. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. We're going to go down to verse 36. This is a lot of people's favorite scripture to quote that they don't know the day of the hour. So read what it says. Matthew 26, verse 30, 24, verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So that's a period after that. That means it's a complete sentence. So about that day. So first of all, we're talking about a certain day. So about a certain day, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Okay? But let's look at the next thing it says. Because people use this as they don't know when he's coming to get his people. Look what it says, verse 37. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So that's different. So this is different than the day that no one knows. See, the day that no one knows is different than it, when it's talking here where it says, so, it'll be, uh, so it's going to be like in the days of Noah. So let's look at that. See how they tie together. For in the days before the flood, People were eating, drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. 
Okay, so first of all, the day that no man knows is called the new moon celebration. It was hidden by God, and you'll see that on the video. It was hidden years ago, but now it's being brought back because that's the day that no man knows, and that's the day that the Feast of Trumpets lands on, the first day of the seventh month. But in verse 37, it says that you have two groups of people. People that are eating, drinking, marrying, and giving a marriage up until the day Noah entered the ark. And the people that were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving a marriage, in other words, living their life, doing whatever they wanted to do, not caring about when Jesus is coming, believing that no man knows the day or the hour, so they don't really care. Right? They don't even think about it. Kind of like the way it is today in this world. All of those people, what does it say? It says Noah knew when to get on the boat. Why did Noah know when to get on the boat? Because Jesus, the Lord, told him seven days before, in seven days I'm going to flood the earth. So get prepared and get your family on the boat. Noah, a righteous man, knew exactly when to get on the boat. It was everyone else who was eating, drinking, married, and giving a marriage. So they didn't know when to get on the boat. But you do. You know that the boat is coming on a Feast of Trumpets. And we pray that it's Feast of Trumpets this year on September 11th, 2018. That's what we pray. And that's why we're going to have a, a, a month-long prayer to pray that Jesus comes on that day. Because the ark is ready. Just like Noah had to wait until the ark was prepared before the animals and the people can come get on the boat. Well, the ark is prepared right now. We now are under God's covenant again. We understand his month of Aviv. We're on his calendar this year. We understand his Passover. We honored it. We honored feast day, uh, first fruit. We honored the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We honored the Feast of Weeks. And we're waiting for the Feast of Trumpets. For the first time in 4,000 years, people are back on God's calendar and waiting for the Feast of Trumpets to go into the Promised Land. Just like the Israelites were supposed to go into the Promised Land years ago. We're ready. So this is the bride right here. See, Noah is the bride. And the people that are waiting that are going to be on that boat are the bride. Let's, are the, are the bride. let's keep reading. Verse 30, 42. <clears throat> Actually, let's read. Starting verse 39. Actually, we'll start, we'll start it again. I just want to read it again. But about that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving a marriage up until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came into them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two will be in the field. One will be taken. One will be left. Two people will be grinding with a handmill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know on what day the Lord will come. Well, we don't know what day is going to come. Because it could be September 11th, which is what we believe it will be. But it also could be September 10th. The reason why is because the new moon could fall on one of two days. So we don't know the exact day, but we know the feast. So as soon as we see the new moon, we'll know the exact day at that point. You understand? Just like Noah didn't know exactly the time and day it was going to rain. But he knew seven days later it was going to rain. And as soon as it started to dribble and rain coming down, guess what he did? He got on the boat because he knew the rain was coming. And so do you. Let's keep reading. Verse 43. Actually, that's all. Right. We're going to read verse 42. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know on what day the Lord will come. But it's very important that you do understand what day is coming. It's coming on the Feast of Trumpets. Let's keep reading now. Let's, let's see who this bride is from a different perspective. Let's go over to Galatians. Galatians 3. Starting in verse 25. Galatians 3. Starting in, actually, we're going to start reading in verse 23. We're going to start reading in verse 23 instead of 25. Let me change that. It says, Before the coming of faith, of this faith, 
we were held custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we may be justified by faith. Now this is the faith that has come. Now that the faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian. So in Christ, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. That's the key, guys. So one of the ways we know that we're part of the body of Christ, and part of, part of the body of Christ, but also part of the bride, is because you have clothed yourself through your faith, and your faith led you to repentance and baptism for forgiveness of sin. So because it says, all of you who are baptized have clothed yourself. So if you have not been baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sin, you're still in your sins, and you're going to see that here shortly. But it's very important that this is the bride of Christ. Verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, nor slave nor free, nor there is male or female, for you're all one in Christ. This is very important to understand. There is no such thing as male and female in the kingdom of heaven. From God's perspective, once you're baptized, you're one in Christ. Your brothers and sisters, you're all equal. We're all equal from God's perspective. There's no men that are above the women. The men are not better than the women. Women that have been baptized for the forgiveness of their sin should be sharing the message of, of God to the women and teaching them and helping the young women and, and helping encourage their friends and family. This message needs to go through all of you. I had a, a guy on Facebook the other day put a post. And it said something. You women, if you're teaching God's word, you're in sin. Repent. You know what I did? Because all these women were getting upset at him. All I did was copy and paste this scripture. Because the scripture says there is no difference between men and women when you're baptized into Christ. So I said to the women on their text, put my post on there and said, it's amazing how many men will put their opinion in the scriptures on Facebook, put their opinion on Facebook without any scripture, but the scriptures always makes them look stupid. So women... Go teach the word of God to other women and go share this message far and wide. Because the world, the, the word of God needs to go to women, men, and women can hear women. My wife right now is out preaching the word to women right this second. So that she can help more people make it to the kingdom of God. Look what it says, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free, nor there is male and female. For you're all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What was the promise that God gave Abraham? That his family would go into the promised land and they would be rich at some point. And we are going to be rich in the kingdom of heaven. We're going to have everything. Do you understand? We are who is considered Abraham's seed. That's the bride of Christ. So now, what's the difference between the church and the bride of Christ? Because that's a big question. A lot of people don't know the difference. So we've got to look at a few scriptures on what's the difference between the church and the bride of Christ. So let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 21. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, and the Christ, as, no, as Christ is the head of the church. His body, of which he is the Savior. So the first thing you got to understand is the church and the body of Christ are the same group. So whenever you hear the words church, or when you hear the words body of Christ, they're the same. They're different than the bride. And you're going to see that a little bit, in a little bit later. But the church and the body are the same. Now they used to be all one. And they're part of one. But you're going to see something remar remarkable here shortly. Let's keep reading. Verse 24. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husband in everything. We're not going to do that study today. <laughs> But look what it says. Husbands, love your wife. Just as 
Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her, the church, or your wife, as him to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So just as we're supposed to do that with our wives, make them blameless and spotless through the washing of her with the word of God by teaching her the word of God, then the same thing, the, Jesus does the same thing for us. Verse 28, in the same way, husbands ought, ought to love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one hated his own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. Now, if you're not married, or if you are married, the husbands, you should be making sure your wives are strong spiritually and well-fed and taken care of. But if you're single, maybe, and you have to work, and you've you got to take care of yourself, and you know what the Bible says? A man don't work, a man don't eat. And don't think that word is just a man. Because remember, there is no difference between men and women in the scriptures. So if you're a woman and you're single, or, and, or you're a man and you're single, the Bible says if a person doesn't work, they don't eat in the scriptures. So you need to work like you're working for the Lord and sacrifice. But look what it says. In the same way, verse 28, husbands ought to love, love their wives like their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are all members of his body. For this reason, a man would leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ in the church. See, he's talking about Christ in the church. The profound mystery is that when you're baptized, you are part of the body of Christ. You are the church. There's no churches. That's why there's 42,000 or 47,000 different denominations of churches out there. Those are not churches. Those are congregations of people. A church is baptized disciples. I am the church. My daughter is the church. My family are the church. The people who listen to this message that have been baptized for the forgiveness of sin, you are the church. Individually, you are church. So that's why going to church makes no sense. There's no such thing, I'm going to go to church. That doesn't make sense. You are the church. You are the body of Christ. So it's very important to understand this. And I know it's a profound mystery, but it's very important to understand that you are the body. And you'll see why in a second. Verse 33, however, each... One of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. As me and Jamie were going through our first seven years of our marriage, we went through a hard, hard, hard time. And this was the scriptures that they kept teaching us over and over and over. But it was really about our marriage. It wasn't about how we are the church. And the church needs to purify itself. And the church needs to purify the, the inequities, iniquities, which is sin out of our life. It was just teaching me that I needed to, to you know, take care of my wife. And that's why my wife, you know, when she decided to homeschool, then amen. And that's what she needed to do, and I needed to fend for our family. I needed to do what it took. And I have. You know, it's been tough, but amen. But God didn't take away anything. As a matter of fact, I want to share something encouraging. Uh, my daughter, just recently, God blessed even our homeschooling. Because even though she wasn't in a regular school, in a regular, uh, you know, regular 9 to 5 school, she just got accepted to a Pac-12 college, Washington State, this week. My daughter, 15 years old, <laughs> just got accepted uh, as a pretty much a full ride scholarship uh, for a Pac-12 college for soccer. And we've been honoring soccer during, you know, Sabbath for the last eight years. But my daughter, God just blessed her with that, just this week. And she had three other schools wanting her as well to give her the same thing. But it's just so amazing because she's so excited about it because God did that for her because that was a prayer for her. If we're going to be here, that's awesome. But she's not concerned because she knows that she believes that the Feast of Trumpets is going to happen. And she'll never make it there. <laughs> and, and we are too. But I just want you to understand it. So it's an exciting time. It's a hard balance for us to live, you guys. A hard, hard balance. But, you know, I just want you to know that we are the church. And God is with us. 
Jesus is with us in so many ways. Let's keep going, though. So now you know who the church is. Let's look at a couple of scriptures about the difference between the bride and the church. Let's go to Revelation. Revelation 1. Revelation 1, starting in verse... Um, we're going to start in verse 9. It says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are that ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on the scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So if you notice, those are different names of churches. That's right, because they were in different areas. So like I give an example, right here in Orange County, we would be considered, save our ministry here in Orange County, we would be considered the church in Orange County. <laughs> That's what we'd be considered. Over there, if you know, I know there's other people in different areas like Florida, you guys would be the church in Florida. <laughs> it doesn't say all those cities, but but you're still the church because you're baptized for the forgiveness of your sin. There's many other things. Many, many other of you are in different areas. Some of you might be in different parts of the country. India. You'd be the church in India. You know, there's uh, the people in Africa. That would be the church in Africa. Or in Kenya, to be specific, in, in Africa. So that's what this is talking about. Those are the different churches that God wanted them to see. It wasn't a church building like what you see that's around the world today. It was the baptized disciples in those particular areas. Okay? But now what we're going to look at is that there's only one church, biblically speaking. There's biblically only one body. See, because you're baptized into the body of Christ. We just saw that. But let's look and see which one church of the seven churches did not go through the Great Tribulation. Let's see. Three, starting in verse seven. The Church of Philadelphia. You can read all the rest of them. You can read all the rest of the churches and see what they went through. And I would recommend you to do that. But this church is the Church of Philadelphia. Let's read what it says. Verse seven. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who are holy and true who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. See, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you you. So what this is saying, those people over there that call themselves Jews, that have stolen the identity of the true Israelites, that are in a land called Israel, are not Israel. See, the Israelites and the bride and the, the body of Christ are all one now. Remember, we just read, there are no difference between Jew, Greek, slave, and free. In other words, there's no difference between Israelite, Greek, slave, and free. There is no difference. We're all one. If you're baptized, you've closed yourself. You're part of the Abraham promise. But those Jews that stole our identity, that are in of this world right now, the Bible says that he's going to make them come and fall down at our feet and say that he loved us, not them. Because the world's been told that everyone loves the Jews. If you bless the Jews, you'll be blessed. That's why the world sent them money for years. They own more businesses than anything on the planet. Look up Google. Google, I, I'm sorry, um, Apple. I just found out Apple just became a trillion dollar company. One company. A trillion dollar company. Go look and see who they're owned by. They're owned by Jews. Almost every major corporation on the planet is owned by Jews. They're rich. But the Bible says that these people are poor and they have very little strength 
and have not denied his name. See, the, the Jews actually deny Jesus' name. You don't deny Jesus' name. You are God's people. You are this bride. Let's keep reading. Starting in verse 10. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. So he's going to keep us, the Israelites. Remember Noah? He kept Noah from the hour of trial, didn't he? But everyone else that was eating, drinking, married, and given a marriage, they went through the great tribulation. In other words, they were all killed. The flood killed them all. Here it says he's going to keep us from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. We're not going to have to go through the hour of trial. We're going to be protected from it because we'll be in heaven, and you'll see that shortly. Look what it says. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. To the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. So that's one thing. He's going to make a temple in the, uh, where, his, where his God is, is of course in heaven, in the temple of my God. And never again will those people leave it. So that's who this group is. It says, I will write on them a name of my God and the city of my name, Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. So that's another thing. Is that he's going to write the name on them. His, God's name on them. And I will also write them my new name. And then I want you to learn this sentence, verse 13. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Whenever you see whoever has ears, let them hear, he's talking to the bride. He's not talking to the body. If you notice, all seven churches in the book of Revelation are all churches. The churches are the body of Christ. They're all the body, but all, the only this church is the bride. And only this church will not go through the great tribulation. So this is very important for you to understand. You want to be the church of Philadelphia. You don't just want to be the body, because the body will go through the hour of trial to test them. Because right now they're just eating, drinking, marrying, and giving a marriage. They're living their life. They're rebuilding their house. They're going on vacation all the time. They ain't thinking about nothing. They ain't giving no, they not giving their heart away. They're not serving the poor. They're not doing anything for anybody but storing up for themselves treasures on earth. Where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. That's what's happening. But these people, they're going to be in the kingdom of heaven. Let's prove it. So now we're going to go to Revelation 14. Revelation 14, starting in verse 1. It says, then I looked. Because remember, this is still John having a revelation. It, remember what the word revelation means. The book of Revelation means things are revealed. That's what the word revelation means. They're revealed. So these things were hidden for a long time. If you look at the book of Daniel 7, God told Daniel to, hold, um, to seal up the scrolls for a period of time until the end. And then God revealed them to people. And that's what's happening now. God's been revealing this to us for the last eight years. He's now revealing it to you. Look what it says. Revelation 14, 1 through 5. Then I looked, and there before me was a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and him with, and with him, 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their forehead. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing water and a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was that of a harpist playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures of the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women. They remained virgins. Let me stop right there. He's telling you who they are. These who did not defile themselves with women. Now remember, the bride is not just a man. So these, these virgins, remember the virgin? We went through the, the, the um, wise virgin. And remember, the, the body, it's no different. Jew, Greek, slave, and free, men and women are all the same. So when it's saying that they are virgin, they did not defile themselves with women. When you understand, biblically speaking, we're the bride of Christ. 
But on this earth right now, there's a false bride. And I'm going to say it, it's the Vatican. That's the false bride that's infiltrated into all the 47,000 churches. That's why they worship on Sunday, because they worship the sun. And if you go do your own due diligence, you'll see. One of the very first videos I watched years ago, eight years ago, was called The Devil is in the Vatican. And that was the first video I watched as God started revealing to me who the Sabbath is. So when you start to learn this and you understand who they are, you'll understand that this 144,000 have been redeemed from the earth. And so these are those wise virgins, the wise ones that went in. Look what it says. So in other words, we are not willing to take on the false doctrine. We come out of the false doctrine. That's why we don't honor Christmas and Easter and, and St. Patrick's Day and Valentine's Day and all these different pagan holidays that were invented by the Vatican. I want you to think about Christmas right now really quick. Okay, you got Christmas. It's supposed to be Jesus' birthday. But it's the most unspiritual time in, in history because people go into massive debt to buy Christmas presents for their kids. Not only do they do that, after that, then you got this, Chris, this Santa Claus guy, right? Now remember who Santa Claus is. His name is Saint Nicholas, right? Santa Claus. S-A-N-T-A. -A. How do you spell Satan? S-A-N. Satan. S-A-T-A-N. Same exact letters, just rearranged. Kind of interesting thought. But let's talk about Santa. He knows when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. Wow. Sound like God to me, doesn't it? It is God. It's the God of this world. And that's why for the last eight years we stopped honoring Christmas and Easter and Valentine's Day and all those pagan holidays because we realized that it has nothing to do with Jesus. If you do your own due diligence and look up the origin of Christmas in the Bible, as a matter of fact, you, you, if you look up the, do the, your own due diligence and look up the origin of Christmas, you'll realize that it has nothing to do with Jesus. It's pagan. If you look up Jeremiah 10, it says, Do not cut down a tree and adorn it with silver and gold and fasten it to wood so it won't totter. Because those are the ways of the pagans. It says it right there in the Bible, Jeremiah 10, verse 1. So read it for yourself. But this is important. So in other words, we remained virgins. In other words, we came out of that false doctrine that's been taught. And that's what God's been doing now. He's been bringing these people from India and from Africa and all over the world that are open. Most of the people in the United States are so indoctrinated in Christmas and Easter and all this pagan worship and Sunday service and all that. They're so indoctrinated in that they can't hear the force if it fell right on top of them. They can't hear anything. They can't hear the scriptures. I show them baptism for forgiveness of sin. Oh, no, it's not. Baptism is an outward sign of inward grace. That's what my pastor told me. It's unbelievable, the deception here. But overseas, people want to hear it. And that's why God's going overseas to go get them, to find his bride. So that's who these people are. Let's keep reading. Verse 4 says, those, These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remain virgin. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. In other words, they follow Jesus wherever he goes. See, a disciple of Jesus holds to Jesus' teaching. You know, John 8, 31 and 32, it says, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciple. So you've got to understand, you've got to hold to Jesus' teaching. And these people hold to Jesus' teaching. That's why nobody can tell me their own opinion, beliefs, and concepts, and theories of what they believe is right. I just want to say, show it to me in the scripture. That's the only thing I ask. Show it to me in the scripture. And that's what I've been teaching all of you. To don't just believe my word. Believe my word, because I'm telling you the truth. But if I don't show it to you in Scripture, ask me to. And I'll be glad to show it to you in the Scripture. Because I don't teach anything without one recording it on video. And I do that purposely. Because I put myself accountable to the Lord. And I said to myself, I won't speak a one word that I can't back up in Scripture and I'm going, to record, I'm going to record every single word I teach so God and the world can hold me accountable. And so that's who the Lamb is. That's who the bride is. They hold on to Jesus' teaching. And that's who all of you that have been with this ministry, you hold to Jesus' teaching. Look what it says. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruit to God and to the Lamb. Remember we read in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20. That first, Christ 
rose from the dead. And then it said the first fruits. And then it said those who belong to him when he comes. This is the first fruit. Those are the bride. It's different than the body of Christ. Verse 9, I'm sorry, verse 5. No lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. And this is who are the bride of Christ. The Lord is trying to appeal to you right now. He wants you to know who you are, for one. But he also wants you to know that he's looking for his bride and he, and he wants you to pour your heart out, to start finding him, to start letting people know these truths and start sharing this message. So how do you prepare yourself to be the bride? How to prepare yourself to be the bride of Christ? We're going to go through this really quick because you know these scriptures. And if you don't know the scriptures, now you will know the scriptures. Matthew 28. How to prepare yourself to be the bride of Christ. The number one thing you have to do right here. Look what it says. This is called the Great Commission. On our YouTube channel, we have a video called the Great Commission. You should go watch it. But this is the answer to that question. How do you prepare yourself to be the bride of Christ? Number one, Matthew 28, verse 16. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Number one thing you got to do is when you see the name of Jesus, you got to worship him and not doubt. See, you got to worship the Lord without doubt. That's the first thing. See, these people saw Jesus die on the cross. He was walking around with them. They saw the holes in his hand, and they still doubted. But you can't doubt. You have to believe in what Jesus is teaching you through these scriptures. That's the first thing. The second thing is, verse 18, it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So the three things he tells us to do is, number one, go make disciples of all nations. So that's what we're doing. All of you that are here that are disciples, you've been following Jesus. We've helped you become a disciple of Jesus. And now it's your turn to now go help others become disciples of Jesus. And that's why God just anointed 200 pastors with this message about baptism. And there's going to be three to 400 more people that are going to be all around this world in Africa and India and different places. And it is going to spread in a very short period of time. And God is going to find his bride. Because we don't know how many of the 144,000 are missing. Because only some of them are dead. The rest are alive and remain. So the first thing we have to do is become a disciple of Jesus. The second thing we have to do is be baptized. And the third thing is we have to obey the commandments. And we're going to look through that right now. So the first thing is becoming a disciple. Here's the scripture. John 8. John 8. 31, 32. And I want to say something really quick. My kids are doing awesome, you guys. My kids are right here. And they're just, you know absorbing this message, and it's so awesome. I love you guys. I appreciate you so much. I just wanted to just say that as we start this next scripture, because it says, uh, John 8, 31, it says, To the Jews who believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciple. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So what Jesus tells us to do is not only just do we have to become a disciple, and what an actual disciple is is someone that holds to Jesus' teaching. And that's why we put these videos out there for you in this message so you can hold to Jesus' teaching. And that's why all the scriptures I give you so you can go look it up in your own Bible and not just take my word for it. There are some times you may need to just take my word for certain things because I'm sharing it with you and I don't have the time to go through a million scriptures. But you can go look up what I'm sharing on scripture. But this is one, is that you need to hold to Jesus' teaching. And the only place you find Jesus' teaching is in the Bible. The second thing you do 
The next thing you have to do is go to act. Acts. Acts 2. Acts 2, starting at verse 36. This is after Jesus died, he rose again. It says, verse 36, that let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, for all who the Lord God will call. So this is the promise. Remember, we're, we're, we're Abraham's seed according to the promise. This is part of the promise. See, the promise is that we will be with Christ and in the kingdom of God. But the Bible says no one will enter the kingdom of God unless they're born again. This is part of the promise. And it tells us who the promise is for. It says it's for them, the people that were there that day. It's for their children, all the children of the Israelites that day. But it's also for all who are far off, which is all of us. All who the Lord God will call, which is all of us and all that's coming until he comes to get us on the Feast of Trumpets. It's all of us. And then he said, verse 40, with many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. So if you notice, baptism saves you. They can be saved through baptism. These people died in Christ. Remember the Bible talked about those who died in Christ will go first and raised to the kingdom of heaven? These are people that died in Christ. They were baptized for the forgiveness of their sin. They were honoring the feast days because this was the feast of weeks. They were honoring the feast. That's why they were there. So they were honoring the commandments and they were honoring the feast days and now they just understood baptism. So this is what they understood at this point. And he said, save yourself from this corrupt generation. And I'm going to say the same thing to you right now. Save yourself from this corrupt generation. Start opening your eyes. Go on YouTube and look at all the deception. Look up a guy named Jason A. on YouTube and go look at some of his videos. He talks about all the deception, all the wars, all the floods, all the human-animal hybrids they're making, all the alien abduction stuff that they're starting to pro pro propaganda. There's people that are talking about all the deception of the UFOs and all the deception of the globe. and It's unbelievable how corrupt this world is. Go look up the music industry and the TV and, and media industry and look up, see how corrupt the rapping industry and the rock industry and the television industry is. Go look. Go look and see how corrupt Hollywood is. Go look. It's right there on YouTube. This is the most perilous times in history of mankind. There's, the, the, there's children being up, taught things by half men, half women. Kids, I mean, children four years old. And some parents in their right mind think this is okay. This, the demonic spirit that's happening on this world right now is at the worst time. As a matter of fact, it's worse than it was in the times of Noah. Because they didn't have internet back then. They didn't have um, computers to, to take our kids and get them addicted and, and, and have them go shooting you know, children in schools. They didn't have that. They didn't have the demonic craziness that's going on in this world right now. The stuff they're allowing in our schools for our kids is unbelievable. And go on YouTube and look, you need to know this. You need to know how corrupt this world is right now. It is worse than the days of Noah. And Jesus says he's coming when it's like the days of Noah. And it's worse than that now. It's like in the days of Lot. And it's like in the days of Noah simultaneously. Just like the Bible says it would be. So I'm going to say the same thing to you right now. Save yourself from this corrupt generation. Look at what it says in verse 41. Those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 
were added to their number that day. That's 3,000 of the 144,000 because they're all dead now. But the key to this message is that those that accepted Peter's message were the ones that were baptized. The ones that made a decision to repent from their sins. The ones that understood that baptism is not an outward sign of an inward grace. It's actually for forgiveness of sin. And right after that is when you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus proved that in Matthew 3, verse 13. Jesus proved it with his life, and the Bible just now said it. See, a lot of people don't understand baptism is participating in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why the thief on the cross didn't need to be baptized, because they were still under the law. Jesus wasn't dead yet. There was no death, burial, and resurrection. When the thief was still on the cross, because Jesus was still on the cross. But when Peter preached this message, Jesus had died, been buried, and was resurrected. So now, baptism for forgiveness of sin is that last part of the covenant. It's the seal that seals his people. It's called being born again. So you need to learn, learn this and understand this message. What else do you need to do to become the bride of Christ? John 14. John 14, starting in verse 15. It says, if you love me, obey my commands. Now, I'm not going to change the translation, but if you go to the King James or the New King James or any other translation, it says, if you love me, obey my commandments. So, obeying Jesus' Ten Commandments is what is considered loving him. Let's keep reading. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it never sees him nor knows him. But you do know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live and you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. So this is another important thing to understand of what it takes to make it. What it takes to make it is you have to love the Lord. And loving the Lord is obeying his commandments. Let's keep reading. A couple more scriptures on that. Deuteronomy 5. Deuteronomy 5, starting in verse 1. How to prepare yourself to be the bride of Christ? You need to know the commandments. Let's read them. Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear Israel, the decrees and laws I declare to you here and today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. Two things. Learn them and be sure to follow them. Not just learn them. So that's why we're going to read them today. Because the Bible says to learn them and to be, to be sure to follow them. The Lord our God has made a covenant with us in Horeb. It was not with our ancestors that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, all of us who are alive today. So this is very important to understand. The covenant was the Ten Commandments that he made on Mount Sinai. And remember, he put them on stone, and he put them in the ark. That's why it was called the Ark of the Covenant. So everywhere the ark went and the Ten Commandments went, and they were obedient to them, God blessed them. When the ark went away... They were cursed, and they were getting into wars and all kinds of stuff. So the Ten Commandments, it's very important. Let's keep reading. By the way, the Lord made a covenant with us because he brought us back into the covenant. Verse 4, the Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire of the mountain. 
At that time I stood between the Lord and you to declare to you the word of the Lord, because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up the mountain. And he said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. This is a very important point for all of you that are new, that the Lord your God is Jesus. It's the same Jesus. Jesus is the Lord in the Old Testament and New Testament, because in the Bible there is no such thing as Old and New Testament. It's all one. So it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You should not have any other God before me. You should not make for yourself an image in the form of anything, in heaven above, on earth beneath, or in the waters below. You should not bow down and worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parent of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me, and keep my commandments. This is very important to understand. Look what it says. It says that he is going to punish the children to the third and fourth generations. God put this on my heart today. You know when the first generation of this started? At Moses. That was the first generation. Because I was wondering, how come it's not six generations from Noah or from Adam? It's six generations from Adam, but it's four generations from Noah. So he did punish the children of Israel for, for the punishment for disobedient the commandments. All the way up until now. But look what it says. Verse 10, it says, But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So it's very important that loving God is keeping his commandments. It says, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Observe the, Sab observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you should not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox or your darkie or your, uh, any of your animals, nor your foreigners are not residing in your town, so that your male and female may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought you out of there with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord God has commanded you, so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You should not cover your neighbor's wife. You should not de set desires on your neighbor's house or land or female servants or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is very important to understand is that these are the Ten Commandments that we need to love the, God, the Lord. And this is what he tells us is loving the Lord. Right here. Verse 22 he says, Then the commandments the Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to your whole assembly, on the mountain, out from the fire, and the cloud and the deep darkness, and he added nothing more. Then he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. <clears throat> this is very important for you to understand. There is so much deception going out there about all the stuff that we have to do to love the Lord and be the bride of Christ. Well, the bride of Christ has to obey the Ten Commandments because the Bible says that he added nothing more. So there's been people out there on Facebook that tell me I have to have tassels in my hair, in my, on my clothes, certain colored tassels. The Bible, they, they tell me that I have to eat certain foods or not eat certain foods. They tell me that I have to wear dreads in my hair. That's what they've said. I've, I've had people say that. They say I have to call Jesus, that the Bible calls him Jesus, that I have to call him Yeshua or Yahshua or, or the Most High or, or all kinds of different names that i got to call him. And I call him all, a, a lot of different names in the scriptures. But they said, if I call Jesus, I'm, I'm in sin. So I obey the scripture. But the bottom line is, when I'm honoring the Ten Commandments, I don't need to do any of those things. Because remember we read, we're not under those laws of the things that we had to do back then. They were there to test the people. They were under that guardian. We're not under that guardian anymore. So we don't have to do those. But we do have to do these Ten Commandments because the Bible says he added nothing more. So if you add something to it, then you're adding something more. 
If you add something that's not in these Ten Commandments, and I don't care what it is, if you add something else that's not in these Ten Commandments, then you're adding something more. And the Bible says he added nothing more. And let's see where we put them. First, uh, let's read it again. Verse 22, these are the commandments. The Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to your whole assembly there on the mountain from out of the fire and the cloud and the deep darkness, and he added nothing more. Then he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to me. So he wrote the Ten Commandments on the two stone tablets. He didn't put any of the Levitical laws on the two stone tablets because he added nothing more. So I'm not going to add anything more. We're going to honor the Ten Commandments, just like the Bible says we are. Now, if you choose to do any of those other things, that's not, there's nothing wrong with doing them. But that's between you and the Lord. The Lord says, this is what it takes to be the bride, and that's what I'm teaching you. And, it's, and then, let's look at a couple other scriptures on what it takes to be the bride. So now let's go over to Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6, it says, love the Lord, your God. These are the commandments, decrees, and laws your Lord God directed me to teach you to observe in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. This is very important. I'm going to stop right there real quick. Look what it says. These are the commandments. So we just read the Ten Commandments. And it's saying that these Ten Commandments are the de commandments, decrees, and laws. Those are the commandments, decrees, and laws that God directed me to teach you to observe. In, to, uh, in the land, and the land was called the promised land back then. We're going to the promised land, which is called the kingdom of heaven. So that's the bride. When you go to be in the kingdom of heaven, this is what he's telling us to do. Obey the Ten Commandments. Look what it says. Verse 2. So that you, your children, and the children after them may fear the Lord, your God, as long as you live by keeping all the decrees and commandments I give you, and so that you may live a long life. Hear Israel, be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey. Just as the Lord, your God, of your ancestors promised you. Let's keep reading. Hear Israel, the Lord, your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. And press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as a symbol on your hands and bind them on your forehead. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. So in other words, the Lord wants us to talk about these Ten Commandments all the time. Almost every video I've done in the last eight years, we've talked about the Ten Commandments somehow. Why? Because the Bible's told us to. We should be talking about it all the time, every day. And we should be striving to obey it every day. If we want to go into the promised land, this is the bride. The bride obeys the Ten Commandments. So anybody on the line that ever tells you that the Ten Commandments you don't have to obey, I'm going to tell you right now, they're taking the mark of the beast. Because if you notice, it says it's going to be on your hand and on your forehead. When well, the book of Revelation the mark of the beast is on your hand and on your forehead also. It's disobedience to the Ten Commandments. So, loving God and how to prepare to be the bride is you obey the Ten Commandments. Let's go to Ephesians. This is also something you must do. And a little about what you should not do. Because what you don't want to do is deceive yourself. Deceive yourself, meaning you got issues going on in your life. You're in full-blown sin. You've been sinning yesterday, or today, or last night, or the night before. And when I mean sinning, I mean deliberate sin. And we're going to look at that. Don't deceive yourself thinking you're going to be the bride of Christ. You might be the body of Christ. You're going to go through the great tribulation if you're the body of Christ. And when Jesus comes, you're in sin. I'm just letting you know. I'm just telling you this based on what I'm about to show you right now. So that you don't deceive yourself. Okay? So let's look. 
5, verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the ways of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up, gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality of, or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. So for the bride of Christ, if you want to be the bride and you want to make it into the kingdom of heaven, it says there shouldn't even be a hint of impurity. So if you've been on the internet doing something you shouldn't be doing or looking at things you shouldn't be looking at, or if you've been talking certain ways or you've been doing certain things that you know you shouldn't be doing, or look what it says, or greed. Greed means you just love money. You just focus on you. Maybe you're you're just um, all all about you. It's not about anyone else in life. But just you and yours. Maybe you and your family and you or the people you care about. You haven't done anything to lift a finger to help anyone else. You haven't even thought about taught, teaching a message to someone. You've never shared a video of this message to anyone with the intent to help them become uh, right with God. That's what greed is when it's all selfish ambition. Look what it says. Verse 4, nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Here's the key, verse 5. For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not partner with them. Okay, there it is. It's about as clear as God can make it for you. That no one that's living an impure life or immoral life um, or an idolater that puts anything above God is going to make it as the bride of Christ. You are going to go through the great tribulation. Just accept it or repent. One of the two. Those are your options. Let's keep reading. For what you were, for you were once in darkness, but now you are the light of the, in the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness. Rather, expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything is exposed by the light, becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. And it is bad. It's embarrassing the stuff that I hear some of the brothers and sisters or people that are out there, what they're doing, and call themselves a believer in Christ. They, call, they think they're the bride. They may be the body. They may have been baptized for the forgiveness of their sin. They may be the body, but they're going to go through the great tribulation. And I'm going to say it as blunt as I can with all of you. So will you. If you're not prepared on the Feast of Trumpets and have truly repented from the heart. God doesn't look at the outward opinion of a man. He looks at the heart. And he wants to know that you truly repented from your sins. Let's keep reading. Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead. And Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Remember we talked about the wise virgins? See, he's telling you, you want to be the wise virgin, not the unwise. You want to be keeping the commandments, the holy days. You want to be ready on the Feast of Trumpets. You want to make sure you've been baptized for the forgiveness of your sin. You want to be wise. Verse 16, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God. 
the Father of everything, for everything, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what, one of the things you got to do to prepare yourself, you guys. You got to repent from your sin. If you're in sin right now, I can tell you up front, you are going to go through the great tribulation. You might be the body of Christ, but you're not going to make it as the bride. Because the bride has prepared herself and made herself ready. Let's keep going. Let's read a couple more scriptures on this. So there's no misunderstanding. Because the last thing I want God to ever say to me is that I didn't tell you. Because the Bible talks about we are supposed to be watchmen. And I believe I've done that. I believe that I've been a watchman for you. And I've shared this truth about as blunt as I could as many times as I possibly can handle it. And so let me go through the scripture, Galatians 5. We're going to start reading it, starting in verse 13. It says, you, my brothers and sisters. So we now know who he's talking to. He's talking to the body of Christ and the bride of Christ simultaneously. You are called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is filled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit is what is contrary to the flesh. Let me break this down for you to make it simple. If you're struggling with sin, and you have not had the ability, you could not repent. You can't repent. Because repentance doesn't mean I stopped for a day. Or I stopped doing it for two days. Repentance means you stopped doing it. That's what repentance means. How do I know? Because I live a life of repentance. I know how much drinking I used to do. I know all the stuff I used to look at on the internet. I know all the places I used to frequent and, and do it in, in the middle of the night. I know all the people I've done bad things with as far as uh, women oh, in my years. I know all the garbage I've done. I know the curse words I used to say. I know all the harsh things I used to think about people. I know all the hatred I had in my heart. I know all the things I did. And I had to stop doing them. It wasn't, repentance isn't I stop today, I do it again tomorrow because God has grace. I stop today, I do a little bit more the next week because I have grace. That's not repentance. That's deceiving yourself. That is not repentance. Repentance is you turn the other direction and you stop doing it. So I'm going to tell you right up front, brothers and sisters, that if you cannot stop sinning, it may be because you don't have the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will help you. It's the comforter. He's the helper. He's our provider. He's designed that the Holy Spirit is designed to help you stop sinning. And if you can't stop sinning, then you don't have the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say it as bold as I can say it. And you need to get the Holy Spirit. You need to make a decision to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sin. So you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's what the scripture just said. Let's keep reading verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality. That means having sex before you're married. Impurity. That could mean all types of things. Internet and all kinds of different garbage that's on there. Debauchery. That means overindulgence in anything. If you overindulge in anything. I, have, I see people on Facebook that in different groups and in different places. I, I talk to so many people. I see people taking a hundred photos of themselves. A hundred. I see men on Facebook and women on Facebook and people taking selfies all day long. And just posting them. Selfie after selfie after selfie. You know what that's called? Love of themselves. That ain't spiritual. You need to repent. Look what that's that's called debauchery. 
That's what that is. It's over. If you're overeating, that's debauchery. If you're over drinking, that's over debauchery. If you're watching too much TV, that's debauchery. If you're on your phone, if you have your cell phone in your hand all day long, you're addicted. That's a debauchery. You need to repent. So look what it says. Idolatry. Idolatry is putting anything before the Lord. Anything. It doesn't matter what it is. If you put something before the Lord, that's an idolater. Witchcraft is taking over abundance of prescription drugs, you know, being addicted to them. Or witchcraft, you know, regular witchcraft, magic, and all that type of stuff is witchcraft. Hatred. If you have hate in your heart, if you hate someone, you need to stop hating them. you got to repent. you got to ask for forgiveness or forgive them. Sometimes you might have to forgive them and you don't even know how to get in touch with them. But you still got to forgive them. Because forgiveness has nothing to do with the other person. Forgiveness has to do with you. Discord, meaning if you're disunified with other people, you got to go get unified. If you are jealous of other people and what they have, that's a sin. If you have fits of rage, if you just pop off and go crazy on people, then that's wrong. You know, if you have selfish ambitions or dissensions and factions, immediately, immediately you put up groups together and go do stupid stuff and go petition the government and stuff like that. No disciples do that. Because we have a different government. The Lord is our government. That's the government we're waiting for. We don't go petition the government. I don't vote for nobody. They're all on the same team. So the Lord said, all of these things, factions and envy and drunkenness and orgies and the like, if you're still, if you're drinking, if you're smoking, if you're cursing, if you're stealing, it doesn't have to be there. You know what a sin is. All you got to do is ask yourself this question. Would you let your kids do it? If you won't let your kids do it, then you're a hypocrite. Why are you doing it? That's a sin. You need to repent. Look what it says. Because Jesus does not want you to be deceived on this point. He doesn't want you to come there and say, Lord, Lord, didn't I honor the Sabbath for seven years with Stephen? Didn't I come and, 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 and give some tithe and, and give you know, some money to, to the poor? Was, didn't I send out videos on Facebook and talk? Didn't I go and, and preach the word? And didn't I go do all this stuff? I don't want Jesus to come and look at you and just say, I don't know you. And that's exactly what he's going to say. Look what it says next. Verse 21, it says, And envies and drunkenness and orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So don't deceive yourself. If you have these types of sins in your life and you have not repented, you might be the body of Christ. But you're not going to be the bride of Christ. You're not going to be the, there on the Feast of Trumpets waiting for the Lord. And you are going to go through the Great Tribulation. Let's keep reading. The acts of the flesh, the, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. In other words, you can do as much of that as you want. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Here is who are Christ's people. Here are the bride of Christ, right here. He just defined it for you crystal clear. They've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If you're still in sin, if you still have sin in your life that you haven't repented of, you are not Christ's people right now. And you are not going to go to heaven when Jesus comes to get his pride. You will go through the great tribulation. Verse 26. Let us not be conceited, provoking and envying each other. That's not my intent with you guys today. My intent is not to become conceited because I'm putting myself in the same realm. I have to look at these scriptures just as much as I teach them for myself. I got to continue to purify myself. I'm not trying to provoke you. I'm not trying to get you mad. If it's provoking, there's a reason. If there's sin in your life and this is bothering you, good, it should. 
And, and I pray that it, it helps you repent. And I definitely don't want you to envy anyone. Because God wants us all to make it to the kingdom of God. He wants us all to be there. So his goal is for us to have faith, you guys. And to make it to the kingdom of God. And to be ready and waiting for him. We're going to read this last scripture. Hebrews. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Starting at verse 1. This is the bride of Christ, you guys. This is what it takes to make it. These are the bride that's going to make it to the kingdom of God right here. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. See, what do we hope for? I hope that Jesus comes on the Feast of Trumpets on September 11, 2018. That's what I hope for. I hope you're hoping for the same thing and not hoping he goes another year. I hope he is not, you know, you're not hoping that he delays it. I hope that you're hoping for Jesus to come on the next Feast of Trumpets. Verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what was seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous. When God spoke well of his offering, and by, and, and, and by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from his life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heirs of the righteous that is keeping with faith. And um, I kind of feel that's where we are right now. I feel we're the new Noah because the Bible says it's going to be like in the days of Noah. And in the days of Noah, there were people eating, drinking, marrying, and giving to marriage and not paying attention. And they knew nothing about what was going to happen when the flood came and took them all away. And it's going to be the same way right now when the Great Tribulation happens on the day of the Lord. There's a lot of people that don't know, but I believe that we are the new Noah because God has built his ark through us. We have the ark of the covenant again. And we've been teaching this for now for eight years. And God is bringing his bride from around the world, as you saw today, to come and to be with him in the kingdom of God. And we built this ark to save our families. And so I pray that, you know, all of our families repent, as many of them as possible. Let's keep reading. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place, he would later receive as an inheritance obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were his heirs, with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous of the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. So if you notice, all these people were living for a promise to get into the promised land. All these people 
And if you keep reading all the way through Hebrews 11, you'll see who all these people are. These are those dead in Christ. These are those who are the dead in Christ. And there are thousands of them. We don't know how many thousands. But what we know, do know is that the bride only has 144,000. That's what the Bible says. And there is no difference between Jew, Greek, slave, or free. We're all given the same spirit to drink. So when you see the 12 different tribes of Israel in Egypt, the, where are the 12 tribes of Egypt now? We're all the 12 tribes that are the bride of Christ. Look what it says. Verse 13. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. Here's another key factor of the bride, of who the bride is. People who say such things. People who say, this world is not my home. People that says Jesus is coming on the Feast of Trumpets and I'm waiting for him. And if he doesn't come this year, then next year I'll be waiting for him on the Feast of Trumpets. And if he doesn't come that year, then I'll be waiting for him on the Feast of Trumpets. And if he doesn't come that year, the next year I'll be fired up and waiting for him on the Feast of Trumpets. And if I had to go until I died, if 50 more years, every year I'll be waiting for him on the Feast of Trumpets, just like all these people did. They died. They all died waiting for the Feast of Trumpets to go into the promised land. And none of them went to the promised land. But they're going to. Look what it says, verse 14. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had an opportunity to return. What that means is if you were focused on your own life here, if you love this world, if you're trying to build a great life, now, you do have to work. You still got to take care of what you got to take care of. You got to have the balance. But if this is your life, this is all you're focused on, he says you'll have an opportunity to return. In other words, you will go through the great tribulation. Verse 16. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared a city for them. Not for the body. He didn't prepare the city yet for the body. He prepared the city for the bride. And this is what it takes to make it as the bride of Christ. Let's end it off with prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for this day, Father. Wow. Father, this message was so impacting for me, personally. Of how you just talk this message so thoroughly and so clearly, God, because you just love us so much. You don't want anyone to miss it. You don't want anyone to deceive themselves, thinking they're right with you and they're not. God, you don't want anyone to think they're the bride when they're only the body. And God, you want people to know what it takes to make it to the kingdom of heaven, God. Thank you so much for our family and for allowing my kids to be here so patient, God, and, and all of us here, this is a pretty long message, God, and everyone's patient and loving it and listening and enduring this message, God, because they want to be with you. And Father, I pray that this message can go far and wide. I pray that we can send this message and thousands upon thousands of people will hear it and will repent and come to be with you, God, and be part of the bride of Christ. And we know you're looking for your bride, you're finding them finding them all over the world. God, and we pray that we can do everything we can and we can pour our heart out to you to help you. We thank you so much for this time. We love you. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen.